In the top of the screen, I wrote down for future reference the formula that I proved in the previous video. Now we're going to work out an example of a present value problem, um, an exercise. Suppose one is trying to choose between two investments. I'll call them investment 1 and investment 2. In investment 1, you pay $2,000 in uh, immediately, which I'll call year 0. $2,000 in year 1, a year from now. $2,000 in year 2. $2,000 in year 3. Then nothing happens in years 4 through 34. And finally, in year 35, you receive a payment of $100,000. So for investment number one, you pay $2,000 a year for the first four years, and then you receive $100,000 in year 35. In investment number two, you pay $400 this year, $400 next year, $400 the year after, and $400 all other years, including year 34. And then in year 35, you receive $100,000. This is an example that is inspired by a homework problem in your textbook, an end of chapter problem in your textbook. The question is, which investment should you prefer? Now it's clear that the, the benefit of the investment, the positive terms, are exactly the same. Both of them pay off $100,000 in year 35. And therefore, we really don't have to take that into account because that's the same for both of them. What we really want to compare is the cost of the two investments, in particular the present value of the cost of the two investments. And we're going to choose whichever one has the smallest cost because the benefit is exactly the same. So, so we need to figure out the present value of the cost of 1 and the present value of the cost of 2. The present value of the cost of 1 is the following. It's minus 2,000, minus 2,000 divided by 1 plus r, minus 2,000 divided by 1 plus r squared. I guess it doesn't matter whether you say plus negative 2,000 or not, but this is a little awkward, so. Let's write as a minus sign. Minus 2,000 over 1 plus r cubed. So that takes care of your 0, your 1, your 2, and your 3. And there aren't any other costs for investment number 1. Let's simplify that. Pull out a minus 2,000. 1 plus 1 over 1 plus r. 1 over 1 plus r squared plus 1 over 1 plus r cubed. Now let's work on the present value of the cost of number 2, investment number 2. It's minus 400 right now, minus 400 over 1 plus r, minus 400 over 1 plus r quantity squared minus dot 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 minus 400 over 1 plus r so the last payment is in year 34. Right. And again I can simplify this I can pull out a minus 400 and I get 1 plus 1 over 1 plus r plus 1 over 1 plus r squared plus dot 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 plus 1 over 1 plus r to the 34. Now the present value or cost of number 1, which is this expression, that's 
not too hard to do just to calculate all four terms. But the present value cost of number 2, which is this expression, that would take a long time. So I'm going to use the general formula that we developed in the previous video, the one of the upper part of the screen, in order to simplify that. So in brackets now, I have exactly the expression at the upper left-hand corner of the screen where n is 34. And therefore, I can write that as 1 plus r over r times 1 minus 1 over 1 plus r to the n plus 1, which would be 35, because n is 34. So that gives me expressions for the present value of the costs. And then if you have particular interest rates in mind, you can plug in the interest rate and see which way would be cheaper. Indeed, since no one knows what interest rates are going to be over the next 35 years, there's going to be uncertainty over it. And you may have your own ideas about what interest rates might be, what the, pro what the subjective probability distribution over interest rates are, over the average interest rate. And you might want to play around with those different possibilities to see which, which one of these would give the smallest cost to obtain this benefit of $100,000 in year 35. What the textbook does, just to make the arithmetic simple, is the textbook assumes that the interest rate is 10%, which is 0 0.1. And I've done the calculations. If the interest rate is 10%, then the present value cost of number 1 is, let's see, it's negative 6,973.5. At 10% interest. And for number two, it's negative 4,243.43 at r equals 10%. So at a 10% interest rate, Again, these are cost numbers, so you want the least cost. And the least cost that is the winner would be this one. It's useful to think about this in general. And this is number one. Graph time versus cost. Investment number one's payment stream looks like that. You have a, a high payment in the first few years and then nothing. Investment number two's payment stream looks like this. You have a small payment, but it lasts for a very long time. The higher the interest rate is, the more future dollars that get discounted, which means the higher the interest rate is, the less important stuff happens in the future. So if you have a, a high interest rate, then what happens in the future, namely this area and this area, is not particularly important. What's important is just what happens in the beginning. And what happens in the beginning is that number one has a lot higher cost than number two. So we conjecture that if you have a high interest rate, then number two will win. It'll be the better investment. If you have a low interest rate, then there's very little discounting going on. And so the the money that you pay in the far future over here is still quite important. 
Now let's think about uh, total payments. If you sum up all the payments without discounting, you just have 35 payments of $400 a piece, it turns out that that's $14,000. These payments for investor number one are four payments at $2,000 a piece, again with no discounting, that's $8,000. So what happens is that when you have a really low interest rate, there's not a lot of discounting, and then these $14,000 aren't discounted very much. And so it appears that um, this that that it's this is pre this is pretty costly. If you have some discounting, then it won't be fourteen thousand. It'll be less than fourteen thousand, but not a lot less. Whereas this alternative is just eight thousand. So, if you have a low interest rate, the 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 payments that accrue here are really important. They don't get discounted much, so they weigh quite heavily on choice number two, and therefore choice number two is not going to be what you want number one will win. Now one could calculate if one wanted to the the interest rate at which it flips from number two to number one. There may actually be more than one interest rate. These are complicated algebraic expressions and numerically algebraically what you're doing is you're finding roots and there might be more than one root and so although the extremes are pretty clear, at a high interest rate number two will win, at a low interest rate number one will win, um, you, could get, you could get flips in the middle. I, I think in this particular case, because it's so simple, you just have negative costs in the beginning and one positive payout at the end, you're not going to get a flip. You're going to have one interest rate where it switches from number one winning to number two winning. But with more complicated cash flows, where you have, let's say, cash flows in year three and seven are, are largely are large positive numbers, but in the other years they're negative numbers, and then you get some other years with positive and negative cash flows, then you can have several different interest rate flips. So that concludes our analysis of this problem.